Great. So, um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much again for um, coming tonight. We're really excited to have um, Dr. Hellman coming to speak to us about the intensive care management of patients uh, with COVID-19. So, uh, as you know from your reading, the United States recently passed a grim milestone. More than 500,000 people have died from COVID-19, which matches the number of Americans killed in World War II and the Korean and Vietnam Wars combined. In the first eight weeks of the course, we've explored SARS-CoV-2 from a molecular level and aspects ranging from virology to vaccine design. However, many patients will become so sick with COVID-19 that hospitalization and critical care treatment are their only hope for survival. In the past year of this pandemic, healthcare professionals like critical care physicians have cared for such patients on the front lines in the fight against this cruel virus. This week, we will be led in a discussion on the intensive care management of COVID-19 patients by one of the leaders of the University of Cincinnati's clinical response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Michael Hellman. Dr. Hellman is an assistant professor in, the, professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. After receiving his Bachelor of Science from Xavier University and his MD from the Ohio State University College of Medicine, Dr. Hellman completed his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in pulmonary disease and critical care medicine at the University of Cincinnati. In addition to caring for COVID-19 patients in the medical intensive care unit, Dr. Hellman has led our institution's effort to ensure that healthcare workers caring for COVID-19 patients on the front lines have sufficient personal protective equipment. Dr. Hellman, thank you so much for your work on the front lines of this pandemic and for leading this discussion on the intensive care management of COVID-19 patients. Excellent, Scotty. Thanks for inviting me to talk to you. I'm really looking forward to it. Again, I uh, work in the medical ICU. I'm an attending physician uh, primarily in the medical ICU, and this has been a wild year. I'm going to share some experiences with you guys. Um, talking with Scotty and what you guys wanted to hear from me, I, I'm going to talk a lot about the therapeutics, um, the investigational therapeutics, as well as our practices in the medical ICU for COVID-19 patients. Um, but it sounds like you guys were interested to hear a little bit more about what it's like to prepare for and be in the middle of the crisis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our personal protective equipment, some of our development of our needs and our uses of personal protective equipment and some of the challenges we faced along the way. I remember uh, working back in January in the medical ICU and I knew uh, things were real when in January I saw leaked footage of people going out in uh, China spraying down the streets um, and everything on lockdown, I could sense that this was going to be real. And then I remember uh, in January into February, in, in late January, January 23rd, Wuhan uh, broke construction on a thousand bed hospital, you know, around the same size as our hospital here at UC, and they built it in 10 days. Uh, and I remember everybody in the medical ICU had seen as it was watching this hospital go up and uh, we were just getting ready to go to battle and go to war at that point. We knew that this was real. We knew that this was gonna come to us. Uh, I spent the last few days uh, with my facial hair and my beard uh, and then I shaved it off because uh, this was gonna be real for us. Uh, February 22nd, Italy locked down uh, Lombardy uh, and the COVID pandemic really crushed Italy in the first couple weeks of February. It's going on just about a year now. Uh, on March 9th, so a year tomorrow, uh, we have our first three cases of COVID in, in Ohio. On March 14th, uh, Ohio, Mike DeWine closed the Ohio schools. And that was really a clear signal uh, to not only the doctors, the frontline providers, but really the hospital systems that this was gonna be a potential disaster situation. And um, the pluses and minuses are, are, are um, what they are, but it certainly sent a clear message that we need to be ready for everything. At that point, hospital systems closed elective surgeries, elective procedures, non-urgent non cl clinic visits. Uh, that happened at UC on March 15th of last year. And all of the administration really hunkered down and started to, to prepare for the potentially worst. Right around March 18th of last year, we had our first COVID-19 patients uh, here at UC. And uh, March 22nd, we had our first two or three UC employees test positive for, for COVID-19. Again, this is almost a year ago today. And so March, especially in the critical care and pulmonary field, we were hit with this immediate crisis where we had to prepare for the worst. 
And a lot of the challenges we face were around personal protective equipment. What kind of PPE do we need? What situations do we need to use them in? Uh, how much PPE are we going to need? There were tons of supply chain issues. Uh, how much PPE can we get from where? Uh, how can we get more ventilators? Do we need more ventilators? Cleaning supplies were in uh, tremendous demand. All of the scrubs disappeared from our hospital that second to third week of March, and we were all of a sudden out of scrubs in the hospital, things you wouldn't necessarily think of. There were infrastructure questions to be answered. Uh, how would you cohort all of the COVID patients? Where would they go? What sort of infrastructure do you need for that? Uh, where in the hospital did we have negative pressure rooms? How could we expand negative pressure rooms? There were plans to bust out windows at the end of hallways and, and turn whole hallways into negative pressure uh, areas. All sorts of infrastructure uh, questions needed to be addressed. Staffing models um, was very difficult. And I'll say that uh, throughout this whole crisis, it made very clear that uh, your most valuable resource in a hospital is your personnel and staffing. So there was lots of surge modeling. How could we bring in additional physicians, additional, additional nurses from other divisions, other disciplines um, to help staff and take care of these patients? Uh, there were lots of quotes going around how in Italy there are no specialties, there are just doctors. So any doctor from any specialty was taking care of all sorts of COVID patients. We had to prepare for how to deal with our staff illnesses when uh, certainly our staff would get ill. We had to learn how to deal with uh, our elderly and pregnant staff. How do we protect them? How do we use them in the hospital? Testing was, of course, a huge issue and a huge problem. And it sounds like you guys have talked with several people about developing testing regimens. Uh, and then, of course, the treatment for how to treat, uh, diagnose and treat COVID-19. We uh, faced a lot of questions about that. The first one I want to talk about is how do we protect ourselves? Uh, just like Scotty mentioned, we're getting around 500,000 people um, uh, died from COVID-19. We had, again, right around 500,000 people, uh, healthcare personnel contract COVID-19. Um, and we have known almost 1,500 deaths of healthcare personnel. And I'll say that this is only uh, data collected from 21 million people. But uh, data for if they were healthcare workers or not was only present for less than 20% of people. So the healthcare personnel deaths may be somewhere five times this number. This is all from the CDC website. So uh, this is not information we knew at the time, but we knew that it was a tremendous risk uh, for our healthcare personnel. So we were dealt with how do we protect ourselves? Um, there was lots of questions about what kind of personal protective equipment we need when we need to implement that personal protective equipment, uh, what infrastructure, we didn't know how coronavirus spread uh, at the very beginning of the outbreak. So we had to look and see how we could protect ourselves. One of the ways we did that was we went back and we looked at the uh, previous similar coronavirus outbreaks. So we looked at the uh, SARS outbreak in 2000 through 2004, we looked at the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome outbreak, uh, a similar coronavirus uh, in 2012, and we evaluated how they, they spread, both in the population. Uh, this is a, a doctor who uh, went to this hotel. This is a layout of his hotel uh, there in green. That was his hotel room, and these are all the people that he spread uh, to uh, his fellow hotel mates on his floor here. Um, and we not only evaluated the community spread, but we evaluated what risk factors physicians, healthcare workers were to contract SARS and MERS, um, what procedures were most likely to uh, expose healthcare workers to contracting the infection, and um, what protection we needed to take because of that. And so, in coordination with this information that we had, limited at the time, but uh, this is what we had as well as information from the CDC and information from the WHO, we at UC, we developed um, protocols and these protocols were developed or find, you know, quickly. This is all done in March and really uh, Mike DeWine shutting down all the schools uh, gave us the time and the impetus to, to show people we really needed to do this right now. So we developed um, uh, 
protocols for what needed N95 protection, what needed simple masks, what needed surgical masks, and, and what kind of uh, infrastructure we needed to protect our healthcare workers. Uh, we did this all in all in March of last year. After we figured out what kind of protection we needed, uh, we scrambled, um, I'll, I won't say scrambled, we quickly organized uh, information on, and educational materials to tell our staffing and tell our um, employees how to correctly protect themselves. There's lots of videos that we built, lots of information, lots of flyers, lots of different ways to contact all of our different staff members to try and show them what we need to do to protect ourselves from COVID-19. As we figured out what we needed to protect ourselves, um, there was this challenge of supply shortage. Um, we were running out of N95s and we had to figure out how many N95s we needed, how many patients we would encounter and how we would get more. And I'll say that one of the great challenges in uh, March of 2020 was testing. So now we have these fantastic testing models where you drive through, uh, you get swabbed, it gets sent off and you get results within a day or so. Um, I'll say in March of 2020, the testing was woefully inadequate, especially those first few weeks of the outbreak. Um, LabCorp and the Ohio Department of Health had uh, options where we could send tests. And, you know, we were told that there would be two to three day turnaround time. Well, when you have somebody coming in the hospital for respiratory failure, um, you're trying to figure out what the cause of the respiratory failure is. And at that time, uh, there was lots of discussion about whether people could have two uh, infections at the same time, whether you could have coronavirus and the flu, or whether you could have coronavirus and a pneumonia or not. And so people were kept under coronavirus precautions. So they were kept under airborne precautions. People were using N95s. And this two to three day turnaround time ballooned in the second half of March uh, to the point where in the second half of March, you were not getting results for a week or more. And these were all patients that would have to stay in the hospital. They couldn't be moved out of their rooms. They couldn't leave the hospital. The hospital was just filling, filling, filling uh, with these quote patients under investigation or people with a COVID test uh, that are getting sent down. And you can imagine the number of times that people have to go in and out of those rooms every day there was an increasing uh, burn rate of personal protective equipment, and it was really challenging on our supplies. In addition to the supply shortages, the burn rate, the testing issues, uh, the hospitals were all relying on this gray market. So, you know, our supply and vendor um, uh, personnel here at UC are, are fantastic, but they were left sort of working on these networking and connections, these people that they knew uh, and these secondary distributors to try and get masks. Meanwhile, they were competing with other hospitals, other vendors, other distributors, and it was very unclear and uncertain when we would get our next set of N95s. For example, uh, I remember as we prepared, we were counting on the shipment of N95s. Uh, we were supposed to get 100,000 N95s at UC on April 1st. Um, and then a day or two before that, we found out that FEMA rerouted and confiscated the N95s that we were supposed to get and, and sent them a different direction. There was lots of um, uncertainty because uh, on the eastern seaboard, a lot of the PPE that was coming into the country was getting rerouted. And so we didn't know when we would get our next supply of, of PPE and masks. It was very difficult for us to prepare uh, in these settings. Um, to try and deal with the supply shortage, we had a whole factor of um, efforts that we organized here at UC. We developed tracking tools, uh, projection models. Um, we evaluated the mass use per unit, the mass use per COVID patients. We developed uh, uh, tools to better track how many days on hand we had before we ran out. So we would see what the usage rates in each, each unit were. You could see that central supply uh, was sending out most of our N95s and the medical ICU was using the next group of N95s here. This is from uh, our March tracking from 2020. And uh, we needed more discrete data. So we changed our system so that we would track not only what masks went out from central supply, but what masks were being used on what units, what masks, how many masks were being used for each uh, 
COVID patient and person under investigation, et cetera. And from those efforts, we could figure out how many masks we needed um, for each COVID patient. And I really thought we were gonna run out in April of 2020. I thought we were gonna run out of masks and uh, PPE. So we set up large conservation efforts uh, with groups of people uh, from across the hospital. Frontline workers really had to be a part of that because we were the ones uh, being exposed to the patients and, and we needed our voices heard in this uh, effort. And so we had a whole bunch of different efforts. Some were to minimize entry into the room. This is one of the strategies we tried. Uh, this is the, a medical ICU room. This is a ventilator. Um, and you can imagine a patient on a ventilator needs a lot of ventilator changes to help them breathe throughout the day. Uh, our respiratory therapists are going in the rooms frequently to try and help our patients. And we were able to set up a system where the ventilator could be in the room and the control panel and monitor could be outside the room so that we could minimize the amount of personal protective equipment that we would burn going into and out of the room frequently. We did this with a number of efforts. Um, this is our IV poles. And again, this is, um, I believe this was in the cardiovascular ICU when I took this photo, but uh, we had all of our medications, our drip medications going on to the patient. They need all sorts of sedation, therapies, antibiotics, uh, every sort of medication that uh, the patient in the critical care could need would go on these IV poles. And as you can imagine, these IVs finish and they need change, they need uh, resupply, they need um, restocked frequently. And so we did all sorts of efforts to see if we could prevent nurses from going in and out of the rooms frequently uh, and burning personal protective equipment that way. And so we developed methods for the, the IV poles to be outside of the room. Uh, and then the nurses could uh, change the IVs frequently without burning more personal protective equipment. Uh, these N95s uh, were gold in, in March and April of last year. And so we needed to figure out how to save these, how to protect these. And they were always meant for single use. Um, but when it became apparent that we were going to run out of N95s in April, we had to figure out how we could safely uh, extend our supply. And one policy was extended use and limited reuse. So uh, we developed methods and how to keep these uh, N95s safe by covering them with other masks. Uh, we developed ways to use face shields to, to cover the N95s and keep them as safe and clean as possible so that we could use these longer throughout the day. The extended use policies, we would uh, put all sorts of coverings over our face and over the N95s, and we would be able to take those outer coverings off and keep the inner N95 on, and then put another outer covering on and go into the next patient. So we would use these N95s, uh, the same N95 all day. I'll say that these uh, small inner pads uh, would get glued to your face and you would take off your N95 at the end of the day and you would have this gray mustache of things that would not really peel off your face. And that was a, a frequent event back then. Our reuse policy, um, we had to figure out ways to uh, extend the life of these. And so when we took these off, we developed ways where we could keep them clean and safe, as clean and as safe as possible and reuse them a second time. Um, from experiences at other institutions, we found out that if these were kept in a uh, plastic bag, for example, that they would get moist and moldy and, and soiled and ruined. And uh, that the best method of keeping these uh, for reuse was in a, in a paper bag. So all of our units filled with these stocks of paper bags for all of our uh, clinicians to go in and use N95s on a repeated basis. Um, we were trying to figure out how to keep them clean. And so there are a lot of sort of groundswell efforts on what to do to clean these N95s. Here you see one of the things we tested was a ultraviolet, ultraviolet box. And it was almost similar to a microwave where you could put some equipment into this ultraviolet box and it would sterilize the equipment uh, for potential reuse. We tested these ultraviolet boxes on various viruses. Here we were testing to see how the ultraviolet box would kill influenza. Uh, and we were experimenting to see if we could reuse these on masks. You may have heard that Battelle was a company in Columbus. Uh, they had a decontamination uh, laboratory where they would do 
various treatments, uh, frequently UV lighting on the masks. And so we experimented with collecting masks after our extended use and reuse and, and sent them to Battelle in Columbus where they would uh, decontaminate them. <clears throat> for what it's worth, that never actually ended up being a useful tool for us here at UC. Uh, with these masks, the limiting factor didn't necessarily end up being how frequently uh, you could sanitize them. The, the limiting factor we think is how good a seal the rubber band keeps around your head. So uh, we found that after five uses, uh, the rubber band would lose its seal on your face and, and you would lose the protection after that. So after five uses, it wasn't helpful to decontaminate it if it had already lost its seal. Around the same time, fit testing was a frequent uh, problem. As we ran out of these uh, 3M N95s, we would have to go to different N95 systems and uh, we would have to prove that each mask fits the face of each em employee that would need, need it. And so we would, uh, they would spray, um, I actually don't know what it is. It's, it's, uh, it, you can taste it in your mouth if it gets inside the mask. And so they would spray that around your face and we, we ran out of the reagent spray to test for N95 fit testing. So uh, all sorts of uh, obstacles that we had to overcome uh, just associated with personal protective equipment and developing uh, mask uh, reuse policies. In addition to masks, there were other sorts of supply shortages. Uh, cleaning wipes, uh, as you guys know, they were not in the stores anywhere. Well, hospitals ran out of cleaning wipes as well. We couldn't get cleaning wipes anywhere. So we used these big buckets and we would uh, mix cleaning solutions. So we had solution sprays where we needed cleaning wipes. Unfortunately, solution sprays don't work uh, in all the settings that uh, cleaning sprays uh, do um, that are, where you need wipes. For example, our ultrasound machines, and I do a lot of critical care bedside ultrasound, when they would get sprayed and, and wet, they would get into the electronics. And we had ultrasound machines that got fried because we didn't have any wipes and we were spraying them. We had similar things happen with our EKG machines. Uh, we didn't have any wipes to clean them down, so we were spraying them and, and the electronics inside would get fried. They're all significant tangible challenges we faced. Everybody was excited about ventilators and ventilator shortages. And, and I'll say again, I'll repeat it, our, our most limited and most precious supply is our uh, workers, is our workforce, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our, our physicians. Um, when it comes to intubated patients, the bottleneck is much more so our respiratory therapists and our, our critical care nursing than it is ventilators. But at the time, we didn't know. Uh, we thought ventilators may be a bottleneck. You can see this is a tally of the ventilators we had in late March of uh, 2020. We had 196 ventilators uh, with 59 of them in use. So we had about 130 extra ventilators here uh, that we could prepare for the surge. Uh, again, we didn't know what was coming, so we were preparing for the worst. And some of this includes allocation of resources. Um, it takes a lot of resources to uh, care for a critically ill patient. And so uh, if we ran out of space, if we ended up uh, in places like New York, if we ended up in places like Italy, there may be a point where we ran out of ventilators, we ran out of respiratory therapists, we ran out of the ability to care for people. So we had to figure out how we would tr try and triage in the, in the case that we uh, ran out of allocation for patients that needed our help. Uh, and so these committees were all ongoing, as you can see here in the second half of March, uh, lots of emails were flying around in the second half of March. More shortages we faced, uh, laryngoscopes that are used in the intubation of critically ill patients. Uh, our supply chain ran out, didn't run out, was close to running out of uh, laryngoscopes. We were at a critical shortage so we had to resort to reusable laryngoscopes. We changed the kind of laryngoscopes we needed. We actually had uh, community companies 3D printing laryngoscopes where we could help intubate patients. And we were um, evaluating this option, testing this out. We never actually had to resort to these, but, but these were places where the, the community was really helping to contribute to our critical care uh, options. In addition, the community uh, helped us with PPE, especially face masks. Um, we really wanted to protect those N95s. This is David, one of our nurses. You can see his N95 there under his face mask. 
And we were trying to come up with ways to protect that with other masks, with face masks, uh, with face shields. And we didn't have enough face shields here at UC. And so we were trying to figure out how to get more and so that we could give all of our staff face shields. And the community really came through. Uh, we were testing here, David, and Sue is one of some of our critical care nurses. We were testing all sorts of different face shields and trying to figure out which ones worked for us, which ones didn't work for us, um, which ones we could use in patient care. And uh, with our data coming, testing them out in the intensive care unit, we had community uh, resources, 3D print uh, thousands of face shields for uh, members at U University of Cincinnati Medical Center. And, and we use these, I, I use the face shield printed from this company today. Uh, when I work, I have a shift here tonight. I'm going to be using this exact same face shield. Various stressors oh, that you Yes, Dr. Hellman, there is a question. Um, Hannah was wondering when you were um, speaking previously about bottlenecks, um, what, what do you mean by a bottleneck in terms of uh, COVID-19 PPE shortages? Excellent. So um, bottlenecks in particular with testing. So we had a patient, we had, we'd have patients uh, where we think this is a COPD exacerbation, for example. Um, but we're not sure if it's COPD causing their respiratory distress because it very well might be coronavirus. And so these people would be in coronavirus units awaiting the results of their testing because we couldn't uh, let them be in non-coronavirus units. We couldn't let them necessarily go home. We couldn't let them go to nursing homes if we didn't know whether they had coronavirus or not. Um, as far as bottlenecks with personal protective equipment, um, you know, there were different areas where we uh, were having trouble with production. So we would um, have trouble with uh, where we could get additional face shields, for example. We would have trouble with where we would get additional laryngoscopes for, for intubating people. And so we would look to different resources to see where we could get uh, additional supplies for those. Um, other bottlenecks would, was it, were along the supply chain. Again, um, a lot of our supplies got uh, confiscated by, by different governmental organizations and redirected to, to crisis areas. Um, so we really had to work around that and figure out where else we could uh, get supplies. Any other questions, Scotty? I'm, keep interrupting me if there are. Yeah, I, I think uh, that was great. So I, I'll, uh, um, I'll definitely interrupt you if there um, come any more. Good, good, good. Um, so some of the stressors that we had in the med medical ICU was personal protective equipment adequacy. Uh, the policy changes, as you can imagine, in those first two to three weeks of March into April, uh, we were figuring out what we needed to do to take care of these people. And policies were changing every few days. And it was really hard to communicate this between administration to management to our frontline staff and trying to keep clear connections uh, were a real challenge and a stressor for our ICU staff. Visitation was a real, um, a real challenging thing in the medical ICU. We have, uh, we face a lot of critical illness. We face a lot of death. We have a lot of end of life situations. And in those first uh, few weeks of the COVID pandemic, visitation just got shut down and people couldn't see their family members as they went from sick to sicker to being critically ill to being near uh, on death's doorstep. And communicating uh, how sick your family member is and what we're trying and what we're doing it is really challenging on the phone. We had to come up with additional opportunities and how we could communicate. We set up iPad and FaceTime systems. We uh, figured out how to get people outside the doors of our uh, patients so that they could see them through the windows um, and set up different phone calls. It was and still is a very challenging limitation as far as uh, a stressor for both patients, families, and staff members. I had a patient admitted uh, to me just a couple days ago from a different state, and uh, the husband uh, of this patient uh, drove in, and it was uh, his loved one had gotten coronavirus in the middle of December, and this was the first time that he was allowed to to visit his loved one in in 13 weeks. He said. Um, and it was just a real challenging time for these patients to, to both communicate how sick they are and to see their loved ones. There's a lot of stressors uh, from healthcare workers about if they will contract the illness, if they'll bring it home to family members. 
Uh, you know, everybody has elderly parents or a, a sick family member or somebody that's immunocompromised in their household. We are all really nervous about um, giving this virus uh, from work to somebody that we care about, one of our loved ones, and, and causing them to be as critically ill as the patients we're taking care of. All right, I'm going to transition a little bit from the challenges we faced, and, and feel free to ask me questions uh, either now or at the end about more of those challenges. Scotty? Oh, I can't hear you, Scotty. I think you're on mute. Sorry, um, Dr. Miller actually has a question. Yeah. Um, Dr. Miller, do you want to uh, unmute or are you going to type it in the chat? No, I'm, uh, yeah. Um, Michael, are the, are, are, is the, are the hospital staff starting to feel the effects of the vaccination? Meaning, are you starting to see people that are, you're, you're having more people that are there and not out because they're getting sick? Well, what are the numbers looking like on that? You, That's a wonderful question. Um, the numbers are so much better. The numbers uh, are were terrible in November and December. In November, we opened up our surge intensive care unit. Uh, we took over a part of the cardiovascular recovery unit, and um, we had to reallocate people. You know, I had a, a urologist uh, trainee. I had a, a dermatologist trainee. All these different trainees being reallocated into different areas. And this really hit the hardest in November and December. Um, I'll say that the numbers since then have gotten so much better um, and that we have been able to shut down our COVID unit um, as of a couple weeks ago. I'm going to share, I'm going to just drag something over. Can you guys see this, um, uh, this chart here or is it still in my presentation? We can see it. You can see the chart? Yeah. So if you see this chart, this is uh, region six is our region, and you can see the numbers are back down to where they were in May, uh, June, July of 2020. Um, our crisis mode, crisis surge mode uh, has significantly improved. And the question is, why is that? Is that due to the vaccine? Is that due to some sort of immunity? Is it due to the weather getting better? I don't know. I personally suspect a lot of it may be that the highest risk categories, the patients in the nursing homes that got crushed the hardest have been vaccinated, and that population um, was really the sickest. And, and, and I, I, that's my personal theory as to one of the significant factors is the vaccine help. What, what about the frontline healthcare workers? That was sort of more what I was thinking about, too. Is there, are you, you're, you're not having staffing issues anymore because people aren't getting sick because they were all vaccinated, or, or what do you think about that? Our staffing issues, we would have people go out, and, and it was a problem, but it was never... Um, it never got to the point where it was tremendous amounts of um, uh, where, where we were limited based on that. So, uh, yeah, the healthcare workers, we have fewer people going out, but typically doctors uh, and nurses are terrible at calling in sick, you know? So we would never, we would go to, I've gone to work doggedly sick before. I'm probably not proud of it, but, you know, the whole attitudes changed around COVID. So people you have a little bit of a fever, you have a cough, all of a sudden, something you would work through uh, all of your life, you don't go to work anymore for this. So things were very different during COVID. Uh, we definitely had more people falling out, um, but uh, it, it never got quite to the crisis mode. We were always prepared beyond uh, the amount of call outs that we had. Cool, thanks, thanks. A little bit about therapies. Uh, so the typical patient we would have, you know, elderly nursing home residents um, were a huge portion of our population. Another huge portion of our population uh, were immunocompromised patients, people with transplants, people with various cancers, people on immunosuppressive therapies. But we really had anyone. I took care of people in their 20s in the medical ICU um, who got extremely sick uh, with COVID. The numbers of cases, just like you said, were over 500,000 deaths now. And the cases were often sort of a bell curve um, amongst our young population from 20s to 60s. But you could see that the deaths were largely cohorted in the elderly patients, although we certainly had deaths in the younger patients as well. I think that it was a, um, a very unfortunate myth uh, that younger patients are not at risk for this because uh, younger patients died from this as well. Who died? 13% uh, of hospitalized patients uh, died from COVID. 
Uh, another 3% of hospitalized patients went transitioned to hospice care. And, you know, something that's really interesting is the mortality in March of 2020 was very different than the mortality, uh, the in-hospital mortality from August. So you can see mortality significantly improved uh, along the line. And I certainly think that the mortality improvement had to do with um, hospitals being more prepared for patients. Um, hospitals, not, when hospital systems got overwhelmed, I think that the mortality significantly shot through the roof. Inefficiencies got much worse. Uh, things got missed. That's just my speculation for why mortality was so much worse at the beginning of the pandemic. As far as critical illness, um, we see the critical Ill, uh, illness starts significantly after uh, the rest of the cases, uh, after the onset of symptoms. So uh, as the pandemic wore on, uh, our case numbers would shoot up in, in the area. And then we would feel that in the ICU about two weeks later when uh, we had this buildup of patients that got sick, uh, you know, 10, 12 days ago, and, and then they would come to the ICU later on. And again, for deaths, uh, this is a similar curve to the case chart, but again, it lags by about 10 days, two weeks. Uh, the ICU patients would come much uh, after the spread of the virus. Our typical presentation, uh, even asymptomatic patients, over half of them have abnormal chest imaging. Most have bilateral infiltrates. They have these patchy ground glass opacities, consolidations uh, that get worse with time and severity. And with a lot of our later stage uh, patients, they have this fibrosis, this scarring of the lung tissue that prevents oxygenation over a long term. This is sort of a typical chest CT in our COVID patients. And um, let me get this laser pointer here. You'll see that uh, it, it's very patchy. So this area is very thick and consolidated where it will have relatively normal lung tissue here. Again, relatively normal lung tissue surrounded by thick patchy uh, infiltrates. Um, and this was a typical finding in COVID. We used lung ultrasound to evaluate COVID patients. And I'll tell you a little bit about lung ultrasound. When we put it on the chest, um, ultrasound doesn't penetrate through air very well. And so the ultrasound beams, when they hit well aerated lung, they all reverberate back and you get a particular artifact on the ultrasound machine. You get this horizontal line in multiples all the way down the screen. And so this is a normal patient here, uh, normal quote A lines. Um, let me get this pointer off perhaps. So these, uh, in a normal patient, you get these horizontal A lines uh, and that represents well aerated lung. In sick COVID patients, you get this patchy consolidation and the lungs are wet. Uh, and when ultrasound beams hit this wet lung, they penetrate, whereas they don't in normal lung. And this penetration comes out in, as different kind of artifacts. It comes out as these patchy B lines, these vertical lines in the ultrasound beam. And so this is a patient with B lines. This represents abnormal lung at the point of ultrasound investigation. In addition to these aeration patterns, they also had different pleural surfaces. So right where the lung meets the chest wall uh, in a normal patient is very smooth and clean. And as far as uh, an abnormal patient, you get this ratty shred sign that you see in COVID-19 as well as other infections. And you can see how this uh, lung sliding on the right hand of the screen is not that smooth surface and smooth interface like you have with normal lung. When we have a patient evaluate with respiratory failure in COVID-19, there are lung ultrasound uh, protocols where we evaluate the chest in various phases, various components, and uh, we can make scores based on these systems. So we can say uh, that this patient has worse disease based on their lung ultrasound score, and these correlate to patient outcomes. So uh, for example, the lung ultrasound score with severe uh, scores 90% of these patients ended up requiring an event. Um, and so this is something quick, non-invasive that you can use at the bedside. All right, with treatment of COVID-19, I'll say um, you guys are gonna be the leaders um, of our community. And one thing I can try and stress with you guys is when you're taking care of people, when you're taking care of patients, when you're leading organizations, uh, be sure to practice evidence-based care. 
So when you're caring for patients, practice evidence-based medicine, use proven data, use data-driven therapies, uh, and leave the conjecture to clinical trials. So uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, there were all sorts of theories that came out. You guys might have seen this COVID-19 physician app. It was helpful in spreading information for about five days. And then all these crazy theories started to get sent out. And people started using this and trying these different techniques. And they had no basis in evidence. So one of these uh, theories was the quad vent. So we're going to run out of ventilators. So let's put four patients on one ventilator so we can ventilate them all. Um, and, and this was uh, resoundingly uh, rejected by any uh, any um, competency, uh, any group of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the anesthesiology group, any professional group that deals with ventilators resoundingly rejected all of these uh, options that were being sent out. You can't safely take care of these patients. Uh, multiple patients on a ventilator. Um, and so there's a lot of misinformation sent out. So when it comes to treatment of severe COVID-19, a lot of the therapies are really proven therapies uh, for any type of ARDS, any type of severe lung injury. And uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome in COVID-19, what that means, what happens is you have your alveoli, your lung units, and you have this inflammation uh, there's direct damage uh, to your macrophages, and they release these pro-inflammatory factors in the lungs. These pro-inflammatory factors in the lung break down the alveolar capillary membrane, and you get this sludge that fills your alveolar units, these lung units, uh, with surfactant and protonaceous fluid. Your lungs get thick, they get stiff, uh, they get filled with fluid, they get uh, edematous, and you can't oxygenate through them. This is the challenge of ARDS in, in COVID-19, uh, of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I'll say that for years and years, uh, we did all sorts of crazy things to patients when they were on mechanical ventilation. Uh, ventilators hurt lungs, especially when we don't know what we're doing. For years, we would give these pe people huge breaths, these big tidal volumes. And they're, uh, in ARDS, some lung units are collapsed and filled with um, filled with proteinaceous fluid and sludge, and they don't get any airflow. And then the ones that are working, and you give them big tidal volumes, they over distend, and the working units end up uh, popping like a balloon. And then you're left with a whole bunch of units that are dysfunctional, more and more dysfunctional, the more time you're on the vent. We would do crazy things like in normal breathing, uh, we generally, humans, take a sigh breath every now and then. We'll take a big, deep breath. Um, and we would have do this on the vent where we would give these people intermittent huge tidal volumes and we would uh, really hurt their lungs through this. We would cause volume trauma, uh, barotrauma from the, from the pressure gradient. We would not give them enough pressure at times and their lung units would collapse and open up and collapse and open up and that would cause sheer uh, trauma to the alveolar units. So we were really hurting people. In the early 2000s, uh, Probably one of the biggest um, studies. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Dr. Hellman, um, there was a question um, kind of relating to your last point on the effects of um, pulmonary tissue scarring. So um, in patients who are both symptomatic and asymptomatic with COVID-19, um, what are the effects of pulmonary tissue scarring? And um, is there any recovery of this pulmonary tissue um, after COVID-19 recovery? That's a great, a wonderful question. And one that we're still figuring out. We have uh, especially in our critically ill patients, we have uh, these acute phases of COVID where they have this cytokine storm, they have this inflammation, and then we have a lot of fibrosis and scarring after the acute event. And um, we have a lot of people in the ICU that their lungs are um, really dysfunctional for extended periods of time because of this fibrosis. Uh, we know that COVID-19 can certainly affect your pulmonary function. We've shown that on pulmonary function tests, and it certainly affects the uh, fibrosis long-term. Uh, we think we've seen that this long-term fibrosis slowly gets better over time, but we still don't quite know how much it gets better, to what extent, to what rate. We're still studying sort of the long-term effects on COVID-19. Uh, you bring up fibrosis is one of the long-term effects a lot of uh, COVID-19 patients have thrombotic events where they'll throw a pulmonary embolism 
and clotting events and, and how does this affect your cardiovascular system? How does this affect your heart, your lungs, your exercise tolerance? Uh, I, I had met a patient just the other day who had COVID in October. He was a marathon runner and now he can't run 800 yards. Um, a, a lot of this stuff is still being studied and we're actively setting up post COVID-19 clinics both to help assist with research to, to see how this is done, as well as provide advice and therapies for patients. So this is a, an active area of research and, and something that we're struggling with as, as well, along with you guys. The evidence. So uh, low tidal volume strategy. We evaluated giving people these big breaths versus giving them low tidal volumes. And uh, the main uh, article here they had 861 patients where they would give a tidal volume of 6 mils per kg of ideal body weight uh, versus 12 mils per kg of ideal body weight. And they achieved different pressures associated with that. Uh, these are the uh, tidal volumes that they achieved. And just to give you guys a, a, a feeling, uh, 6 mils per kg of ideal body weight for a general sized man is around 400 mils. So if you think of a 2 liter bottle, um, it's about a, a quarter of that. Um, and, and so these are small breaths. If you, if you try to breathe just that amount, we would used to give them much more natural feeling tidal volumes and, and breaths, but we found we were hurting people. Um, and as far as survival curves, uh, when we gave them smaller tidal volumes, we decreased the mortality. Uh, the mortality was 31% versus just about 40%. We got them off the ventilator sooner. Um, we had less people with collapsed lung, less people with pneumomediastinum, less barotrauma from using those high volumes and pressures. And when somebody dies from acute respiratory distress syndrome, they tend not to just get so hypoxic that their heart gives out per se. What happens is they have non-pulmonary organ failure. So your kidneys start to give out and then your liver starts to get out. And then maybe you have a stroke or your mental status deteriorates. And so when we take good care of the lungs, we see fewer non-pulmonary organ failure. Um, our other organs uh, don't get uh, trashed as well. Other effective treatment is fluid managed therapy. Scotty. Um, Dr. Hellman, there was a question from Ashley. She was wondering um, at like the molecular level with uh, ARDS and the, all, everything going on with COVID, um, is there any, any evidence for complement activation in severe COVID-19 patients? And um, is there any relation between COVID-19 and uh, thrombotic microangiopathy in these patients? Wonder, wonderful question. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit because when we get to therapeutics, that's one of the big questions is uh, how do we treat this? Do we treat the, the, the complement? There's lots of... Uh, evaluations in convalescent plasma and antibody therapies and, and all sorts of different treatments. And, and this, a lot of the same thoughts that you're having are, are what our wonderful MD, PhDs and, and physician scientists are investigating across the country. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the therapies that have, have been investigated. Um, and a lot of the answers is, is that we don't yet know, but I'll say we know more about COVID-19 than almost any disease in history because of the communication, the global communication and the global investment in COVID-19. The amount of information that's coming and it's all coming out right, right now is really tremendous and, and unprecedented in, in my opinion. All right, uh, before we get to therapeutics, I wanna talk a little bit about ARDS a little bit more. Some of the things that work are uh, dry lungs or happy lungs. We've studied um, a fluid liberal strategy where people got more fluid uh, after seven days, they were about seven liters positive uh, for their ins and outs, and they had gotten less Lasix, less diuretics, the less medicine to, to make them pee off all this fluid, uh, versus a flu fluid conservative strategy for acute lung disease uh, and ARDS, where they, uh, at seven days, were about net even, or maybe even they had uh, a little bit net negative fluid balance, and they had gotten more diuretics. And what happened was uh, they didn't show a mortality difference but they had less time in the vent and, and fewer times in the ICU. Uh, sedation is a huge challenge in COVID-19 and, and really any ICU patient. Uh, you know, you have patients similar to this. This is a, a, a Marine being transported actually, um, but our COVID-19 patients can, can have this much machinery and support. 
Uh, there's lots of fears in particular with COVID-19, fear of the patient waking up to the point where they take the tube out. And then there's this emergency where they uh, take their breathing tube out and staff has to rush into the room and potentially be exposed to all the aerosols that are generated. Um, the time where they get their personal protective equipment, the patient is at huge risk to pass away because they're not on life support. All sorts of concerns about uh, pain and sedation associated with this. So, but I'll say that we, uh, I think it's most important when we rely on what's known. So we know that when we uh, interrupt sedation infusions on a daily basis, we give people less sedation. People uh, get off the ventilator sooner, they're out of the ICU, we're not doing investigations into why people are not waking up. We save 20% of the people uh, don't get head CTs that otherwise would get head CTs because we're not sure why they're not waking up. And, and people's brains are ready to get off the vent uh, sooner. In the COVID-19 pandemic, we were running out of propofol, some of our sedative medications. And so in addition to being all this fear about uh, your patient coming off the vent, we were fearful that we would run out of sedatives. So we had to develop uh, oral replacement therapy sedatives for giving people oral medications to, to keep them sedate uh, and avoid over sedating. A therapy that works in COVID-19 ARDS is proning. So um, when you prone somebody, uh, in ARDS, you have all these heterogeneous areas of your lungs. So the, the most gravity dependent are all filled with uh, protein and sludge. And then the, the anti-gravity dependent, the, the ones in the most um, uh, superior sections of your lung are over distended. They don't have any protein sludge in them, but all the air is getting to them over distending them. And those are the ones that you cause injury to on the ventilator. And we find that when we turn people upside down, uh, we do less damage to the good lung units and we are able to use more of the lung units in general. So we prone people, and this is, uh, we've gotten better and better at how we do this. Uh, we used to use these beds, these proning beds, where we would lock you in like a clamshell and turn you upside down. Um, but these days we're excellent at not doing that because we're, we can do this manually. And this is what it's like in our medical ICU. Uh, our nurses printed off t-shirts that they were the swim team because they would uh, swim patients and turn them upside down uh, so frequently everybody was getting turned upside down. And the evidence behind that, uh, large trials again, where people were proned on their stomach 16 hours a day, and there was a significant mortality benefit. Um, the number needed to treat to prevent one patient from dying was six. Uh, you had more ventilator-free days. And so a lot of this question has been translated not only to people on the ventilator, but people off of the ventilator, self-proning in awake, non-intubated patients. It's been shown that this improves oxygenation, they need less supplemental O2. The big question is, can they avoid intubation? Do you, can you improve mortality? Can you improve recovery? It, it's really unknown. We don't know at this point. Uh, and then a salvage therapy is ECMO, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. What we do is we take the blood out of the body, we oxygenate it, um, just like cardiopulmonary bypass, and then we give it back to the body. And the thinking is that you can uh, reduce the damage caused by that ventilator where you can let their lungs rest until this acute COVID-19, this viral infection, this acute um, insult recovers. As far as ECMO, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, you have basically garden hoses going into the patient, uh, oxygenating and providing their blood back from this oxygenation system. Um, about three to 4% of COVID patients admitted to the ICU get ECMO. And we think that these people uh, do better with ECMO. We About half of them survive um, to leave the hospital. And, and about uh, in this study, 15%, 17% were still in the hospital. Um, when we compare this to non-ECMO patients uh, of similar disease illness, we think that there's a mortality benefit as well. Now, there's a lot of drug therapy targets uh, in COVID-19, and a lot of this is dependent on what level of illness the patient is at. A lot of the drug therapy targets are uh, targeted at, is it the viral response rate? Somebody mentioned complement and your host inflammatory uh, responses. Um, there's many different targets that people have assessed and lots of different thoughts about where we can intervene. 
As far as drug therapies, there are antimalarials. I'm sure you guys heard about hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, zinc. There's antivirals, anti-inflammatory therapies targeting different parts of the inflammation cascade, the cytokine storm, the JAK2 inhibitors are, again, anti-inflammatories. Um, and then other things like ivermectin and convalescent plasma have all been um, thought to potentially have uh, uses. And this is an amazing point in medical history in that we have so many uh, clinical trials, so much investment in knowledge that we know more about COVID-19 than any disease, um, any infectious illness that I, that I can think of. Um, and so, and so far as what works and what doesn't work and, uh, for better or unfortunately, a lot of this has shown no improvement in outcomes, all of these interventions, um, and tons of different targets. I'll say that something that has made a significant impact is corticosteroids. So the recovery trial, they had 6,500 patients, um, and they had lower amounts of death in the mechanically ventilated patients. They had some improvement in people who needed oxygen but they didn't show any difference if you were not on oxygen. Again, this is the um, benefit uh, survival chart here. Uh, then another investigation is remdesivir. It's an antiviral, it's an in inhibitor of RNA polymerase in the virus uh, that is shown to have activity against uh, SARS and, and Middle Eastern respiratory uh, virus. And the remdesivir group recovered a little bit shorter amount of time. Uh, they didn't show a mortality benefit at day 29. And then barcitinib is a JAK2 inhibitor, thought to be uh, inhibiting the signaling pathway in the dysregulated cytokine storm. There's some trials showing that this, in, in combination with remdesivir, may help. As far as it comes to our patients in and out of the ICU, the benefit was largely seen outside of the ICU, people that weren't on mechanical ventilation. And here, this is the benefit on, on pay, people with uh, either mechanical ventilation or ECMO, and you can see there's no significant difference there. There are lots of therapeutic investigations here at UC. Uh, Mavrolibumab is a GMCSF signaling antagonist, again, working on that cytokine pathway to see if we can decrease the harm that our own body causes uh, when we have this dysregulated infl inflammatory state. Uh, we were part of this several monoclonal antibody uh, investigations. Uh, this one did not show any improvement. It was uh, published in December. Active 4, there's a lot of thought about anticoagulation. Like we mentioned, there's this prothrombotic state. And uh, so far, the early enrollment in the intensive care unit was stopped. It showed a lack of improvement. There was some suggestion that it may be doing extra harm. Um, the uh, enrollment in the uh, non-ICU patients were ongoing, and, and so that data is still uh, yet to be published officially here. I don't really think there's gonna be a silver bullet in uh, medical therapies for critical care of COVID-19. Uh, I don't think there's gonna be an investigational drug that chose uh, to be a silver bullet. I do think there will be subgroups where maybe convalescent plasma in this group or tocilizumab in this kind of group is beneficial. And I think we're yet to find those out. I think we will find those out through the investigation. I think as far as silver bullets go, I think vaccinations are the closest thing that we're gonna get to a silver bullet. Um, my, my personal questions are, I'm really excited to see about anticoagulation and the anticoagulation studies and the anticoagulation cascade effects. I uh, have a lot of difficulty in, in knowing, uh, treating these patients with antibiotics and, and who to treat with antibiotics, how to uh, not overuse antibiotics and use them appropriately and be a good antibiotic steward but still have the patient that's in front of you at, at your prime, uh, most important uh, decision-making. And then the timing of intubation uh, and when we put these people on breathing machines is, is, my, uh, is another area that I'm really looking forward to knowing more. Should we put people on these OptiFlow? Should we put them on BiPAP? Should we put them on different respiratory support systems? Or should we intubate earlier? Are they gonna do better if we intubate them? Again, use evidence-based medicine. There's this fantastic uh, website, covid19treatmentguidelines.nih.gov, that give all sorts of treatment guidelines and the evidence behind what we're doing. And use these guidelines. Use guideline-based strategies. Use therapies that are shown to work in the ICU. Right now, there are very few drugs that work in the ICU. 
But I think that uh, wait until these uh, the evidence comes out and, and you, when there is evidence, use that. Focus on good critical care practices for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, and don't try things just to try them because um, there was a lot of pressure to do that uh, in the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic. And we really need to wait for the evidence before we do it. I went a little bit over. I had intended to leave more time, but I'm happy to stay and talk questions, uh, see what you guys have to say. Yeah, that, that was an absolutely fantastic lecture, Dr. Hellman. Thank you so much. Um, and students, I'd invite you, um, if you have questions, um, please um, put them in the chat. In the meantime, you guys, uh, my contact info is there. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. I, I found the chat button. Uh, I see Sruti's message. There have been studies that show individuals who, who have recovered from severe COVID-19 have scars on their lungs. Have there been any effect studies on uh, the effect of these scars? Like, does it affect functionality of lungs and reduce breathing capacity? Yes, 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 it does reduce breathing capacity. It does reduce their pulmonary function tests. And there's studies going on um, you know, with what sort of drug interventions can we have? We have um, drugs that affect the fibrosis, um, nintenanib and perfenidone, different things we use in other disease states, pulmonary fibrosis states. Can we apply these drugs and therapies to COVID-19 and the fibrosis that you get in these post-viral cases? Um, there are active studies with this. And, and um, a lot of these recovery uh trials are just starting to we're just starting to find this out and i think it we're right now getting a lot of the treatment information uh, a lot of the trials are coming out about treatments i think it's going to be another six months before we have really good database about the post-covid recovery information uh are there any preventative measures you see as being beneficial other than vaccinations possibly ways to fortify lung tissue in patients at high risk for ards development that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think vaccination is the most important thing. I, I think you can try and be healthy. I think that our patients who are uh, debilitated, who are obese, who are um, otherwise not very functionally active people are the ones that do the worst. So, you know, uh, outside of uh, vaccinations, living a healthy lifestyle, being fit, uh, certainly being young, but that's not something you can change. Uh, but being uh, more cardiovascular uh, fitness is certainly something you can uh, do and change. Uh, we talked about immunosuppressed patients are high risk. Do you see these uh, in intense immune response given their immune system is not supposed to be functioning at full capacity? The really, the, the worst outcomes I see are these, are these transplant patients. We have a lot of kidney transplant patients here, and it's been really hard, the patients that get kidney transplants or other transplanted organs, um, people with different kind of malignancies that affect their immune system, and it's been really uh, hard on them. It really wreaks havoc. Um, I'm hopeful that some of our uh, immunotherapies uh, may find these subgroups of people who are immunosuppressed, and, and maybe the targeted drug therapies might affect them more or less. So I'm hopeful that our subgroup analysis might show some of this. Um, have you ever found that once a patient recovers, do they ever get readmitted with post-recovery related symptoms? Um, I see the sickest of the sick. So I see people who COVID-19 wrecks their lungs. I see a lot of people who end up on ventilators who are trach to vent and go to trach to vent facilities. And a lot of these people get repeat infections and come back to the hospital frequently. Um, and how much of this is from their COVID course waxing and waning and how much of this is from a new infection is really hard to tease apart but we certainly do see people get readmitted uh, on a regular basis. Um, have I avoided physical and emo how have I avoided physical and emotional burnout through this past year? Um, you know, I, I think that working on the front lines is extremely rewarding. Working with these, we have an amazing group of nurses that we work with and, and it's really been a family environment. I think we're really lucky in that matter. So, um, you know, it's like working with your brothers and sisters. On the other hand, I'll say that the pandemic has been different for all of us. And for me personally, it's given me a lot more time with my family. You know, I, it, rather than running around, I'm, I'm with my wife and two little girls all the time and I spend more time with them. And that's been really 
uh, relieving on a, on a personal factor as well. Um, are there any ways to prevent patients who have moderate symptoms of COVID to, from uh, developing more severe, more critical symptoms? Yes. So there are drug therapies um, targeted antibodies that are shown to to be effective in mild to moderate uh, COVID-19. Uh, there's this whole disease spectrum. And I think that there are definitely um, targeted therapies that you can use in different uh, spectrums of the disease severity that will be useful. For example, I think dexamethasone is only uh, really effective in the sickest of patients, whereas some of the monoclonal antibodies are, are perhaps much more effective in the early stages of the disease. So I, I think knowing when and where to use targeted therapies is going to be really important for us. Um, let's see here. Well, with the potential restrictions being lifted, including many state mass mandates, would you expect COVID cases to increase again? Or now that the, we have the vaccine, will no, uh, numbers be lower than previous spikes. You know, one thing I, I, that's clear to me is I just don't know. I try to prepare for anything and everything. Um, certainly a lot of my colleagues are very concerned that the mask mandates being lifted um, will uh, result in worse numbers. I, I'll say I don't know. And, uh, you know, we get a lot of personal questions. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I visit another patient or another uh, family member? And I think that there's no right or wrong answer for everybody. Everybody's risk tolerance is very different. And it's it's easy to judge people um, and to cast judgment. And, and I think that that's very hard in this pandemic because um, some people have, just have different tolerances than everybody else. So I, I think it's um, important to try and be uh, respectful of other people who have different tolerances and, and than you. That, that, that's all the questions I think I got. Scotty, do you have questions or issues? No. Uh, any just any final questions for Dr. Hellman? All right. That looks like it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hellman. Um, I can say this has been such an informative presentation. I think I speak for the entire class when we really appreciate all you've done, um, not only for us in this lecture, but just everything on the front line. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. I appreciate my time with you guys. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, send me an email if you guys want to get in contact. Uh, if you need anything, if I can help with anything, I'd love to talk to you.